Before we uh, get into the message this morning, Pastor Mark and I uh, exchanged a, a couple of texts on Wednesday um, after the election and just thought it would be appropriate for me to just share just a, a thought from him uh, connecting to the series of messages that he's been bringing to us from uh, Romans chapter 12. And if you remember the message uh, from last week, it was, it was no, no paybacks. And uh, the gist of the message is that we're to love even our enemies. And, and so this, this is basically the, the word that, that Mark gave to me to bring to you this morning in, in the wake of the election and as we move forward, hopefully, in, uh, in, into the future. It just, he just says, tell them to remember last week's message about no paybacks. Romans 12, verse 17 and 21, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Whether you are happy or sad about the election results, we are called to show love to one another in word and actions. And I would just add, especially to our brothers and sisters that we worship together with. So we thank you, Pastor Mark, for that. I'd just like to read um, a gospel text this morning that we'll be spending some time this morning looking at. And um, as you are able, and if you would like to, some, some traditions uh, always stand when the gospel is read. So I would invite you just to stand if you are able, and then you can be seated after I finish uh, the reading. It, it's in the Mark chapter 1, and it's verses 9 through 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. May the Holy Spirit add to our understanding and appreciation of these words. You can be seated. Father, it is... Uh, it is a humbling experience, but also a, an exciting experience to be able to stand in front of a gathering of people who believe in the Word, believe in you, whose lives have been changed by the gospel, whose very presence in this room is a witness to the world that you are alive and that you are still active in the world. And so, Father, I pray that you will forgive me for my sins. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable to you. And I pray that anything that comes out of my mouth this morning that is encouraging or challenging or strengthening to this group of people will find its mark in their hearts and do that for them. If there's anything that's said that's not in line with what you want us to hear this morning, I just pray that you would strike it from all of our memories. And again, I thank you for the privilege of being able to do this. Amen. Well, I'm not a, uh, a rookie pastor, which is obvious. Uh, I've done this uh, many times. In fact, I was with you uh, in July and have been uh, attending and worshiping with you and getting to know a few of you, and so it's, it's good to be back with you in Pastor Mark's uh, absence. I don't know if I said this um, the first time that I stood up here back in July, but, but I, I do like to remind people, and I know that Mark would share this sentiment as well. You know, I stand up here behind a podium. I don't necessarily like to stand here behind a podium, and I'm standing kind of elevated above you. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly don't view myself as being above you. Uh, I, I'm not, if, if anything um, really grabs your heart this morning, it's probably because it's grabbed my heart. Uh, when I think of preaching the gospel, when I think of sharing the good news, I, I always want to share it to myself first. And so I, I, I'm not above you, I'm with you. I, I'm a fellow pilgrim on this journey with you. And so I, I do want you to know that. I'm certainly not a, an expert. I am a veteran, not a veteran in, in, in the service, but a veteran of, of doing this. And, uh, and I enjoy doing it. I love the church, and uh, I love the Lord, and I'm excited to be able to share with you. You know, as I was pondering this, this snapshot from the life of Jesus at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, um, an old song came to my mind. <laughs> now, the purpose of this message is not to parse or to criticize this old song, but the old song was Home, Home on the Range, 
We could all sing that song, right? Don't, you don't have to pick it up, but, <laughs> but, but I, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking that, you know, whoever wrote that song, well, it's, it's, it's just a feel-good song, right? And I was thinking about it, though, because, you know, Hastings, Minnesota is not the range, home, home on the range. <laughs> um, deer and the antelope, I've never seen antelope in Minnesota, most of the deer that I've seen have been in another condition along the side of the road. <laughs> and then how about that other line that says, and never is heard, what is it? A discouraging word. And I want to say, wow, where are you from? <laughs> Maybe we should change that lyric of that old song and say, where never is heard, an encouraging word. <laughs> because often, probably every day, really, if we stop and think about it, we are bombarded with in discouraging words. Discouraging words that come from outside of ourselves and discouraging words that come from within ourselves. Now this morning, I want to offer you, I, I hesitate to say that it is the most encouraging word that can come to God's people but I don't know how we can underestimate the importance of this word. Now, I want us to look at this passage, and I want to think about the content of this encouraging word. I want us to think about the recipient and the recipients, plural, of this encouraging word. I want us to think about the timing of it, and I want us to think about the results of it. Now, the first two, the contents and the recipients, are going to kind of blend together. But I want to take you through this. The content of the encouraging word comes to us very obviously in verse 11. This is a, this is a very dramatic scene. And, and it's very interesting to me uh, where, it, where it comes. We're, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the timing of it. But Jesus is being baptized, and it says in verse 10, As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart. That's a, that's a strong verb, ripped open saw heaven being torn apart, and then a dove. What a contrast of words descending gently. A dove, a, a gentle creature descending, and then he hears this voice from heaven. And this is the content of the encouraging word. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So that's the content of this encouraging word. And you're saying, well, yeah, that's great. That came to Jesus. Jesus is the recipient of that word. But I want you, please, to stay with me on this, and I want you to get this. I want you to take this in, and as much as you are able to do this, I want you to, to own this this morning. Because I believe in the depth of my being that this word is also for us. It's for you. It's for the church. It's for those whose lives have been changed by the power of the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Can you get that? <laughs> now, I don't want you to get it just because I'm saying it. I want to show you a couple of verses that will help us to, to understand and to believe that this is true. In Galatians, the book of Galatians, in the third chapter and also in the fourth chapter, the notion of us being co-heirs, you know what an heir is? Of course you know what an heir is. An heir is someone who receives something from someone who has gone ahead of them. We are, we are told that we are co-heirs with Christ of everything that God gave to Christ. Now, obviously, we're talking about the, the, the divine nature of, of Jesus as the Son of God and as the Son of Man. But hear this from Galatians chapter 3. And this is verse 29. If you belong to Christ, and, and we claim as members of the church that we belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, there's that word, heirs, according to the promise. 
And then if you skip down in chapter 4 at verse 7, it says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And the Apostle Paul is not being sexist. You can include daughters in there as well. So you are no longer a slave, but a son and a daughter. And since you are a son and a daughter, God has made you also an heir. Now we can think of being an heir to all sorts of things, but I want you to hear this morning as we think about the content of this word that came to Jesus from heaven that is also coming to us because we are heirs of all of the good stuff that God the Father has given to God the Son to encourage him and to equip him for the ministry that he had in his life on this earth. And then one other passage that uses the exact same word, in fact, that phrase, uh, you, you are my son whom I love, is literally the beloved. We don't use that word much anymore. Has ever, ever, anybody ever called you their beloved? <laughs> Jesus was, God the Son was God the Father's beloved. In the book of, in the book of Ephesians, in the first chapter, in verse 6, that same word is used. By the way, Ephesians chapter 1, um, verse 3 through 16, 14, lists all the spiritual blessings that are ours who are in Christ. And verse 6 says, To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us, given to us, the church, church believers, believers in, in the, the one he loves. loves. That's in Jesus. And he goes on to mention all those other spiritual blessings that are ours. So I want you, if you don't, if you don't hear anything else this morning, and hopefully you'll hear more that will be encouraging to you, will you hear that that voice that came to Jesus at the very beginning of the last three years of his life, <laughs> sounds kind of funny to say it that way, doesn't it? That was sort of his public ministry, right? Sort of his coming out, if you will. He hears this voice from heaven, and that voice is for us as well. Because God wants us to know that we, we are the Christs in the world today, when Christ lives in us. And so God wants to equip us and empower us just as he wanted to equip and empower Jesus for the ministry that he had. So the content is this voice that says, you are my beloved sons and daughters in whom I am well pleased. And we are the recipients of that as well as Jesus. Now I want us also to think about the timing of this because you probably recognize, if you've spent any time looking at the Gospels, that Mark sort of, he doesn't sort of, he, he dispenses with any of the birth narratives, right? We, we'll, we're coming up on Advent, and we love to hear the birth narratives of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke. Mark doesn't have any of that in there. <laughs> he, in a sense, cuts right to the chase, and that's the, kind of the way Mark writes. He's sort of in this staccato style. And it says, that, you know, verse 1 says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then we, he goes into a brief description of John the Baptist. And then we come to this scene that we, just, that we just heard read, this scene of Jesus being baptized and him receiving this message. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus would have heard these words at the very beginning of, of him going out onto the highways and the byways of Palestine and engaging in all the miracles and the teaching and being a victim of all the criticism and the verbal abuse and the physical abuse that came upon him, he, he receives this word from his father, this word of reminding of him of his identity. And it's, I believe that this equips him to be able to do the things that he was able to do and to live the way that he was able to live because he was so secure in his identity. He was so secure in knowing that he didn't have to prove that he was worthy of love that he was able to do what he did. And also I want you to notice what happens immediately after he receives this encouraging word from his father. Verse 12 says, At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Now, 
<laughs> doesn't it seem like it would be better of God the Father after he gave him this good word to have a party for him? <laughs> but he sends him out into the wilderness, and we don't hear the details of the temptations in Mark's gospel, but you can look in Matthew and Luke, and you know the nature of the temptations. And what was Satan trying to do to Jesus when he was tempting him? He was trying to get him to hear other voices about his identity. He was trying to get him to believe that he had to do other things to prove himself, to prove that he was worthy, to prove that he was enough. And because Jesus really believed what God the Father had said to him about God the Father being proud of him, about him being God the Father's beloved, that he was able to endure those temptations. Now, obviously, we are not Jesus. But we have the temptations thrown at us every day, right? I suspect, and again, I'm, I know that I'm preaching to myself here, how many of us have, not, have never struggled with the sense of being enough? I'm not good enough. I'm not good-looking enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not a good enough athlete. We struggle against that all the time. And that is an attack on our true identity because we are enough. God's word coming to us that we are his beloved sons and daughters and that he's proud of us is enough. Now, we need to hear that every day. I know I need to hear it every day. I need to sit in, in the presence of God my Father and sense his presence with me and sense his arm around me and listen to that still small voice reminding me that all that I hear from the world telling me that I'm not enough is not true. There's no other you walking around the planet Earth. No other you. So be you. Be who you are. Be thankful who you are. Don't listen <laughs> to the voices, and, and probably the worst voice is the one that comes from inside of us, right? That, that self-critic that shouts at us, oh man, you blew it. Don't listen. <laughs> we need to be reminded of that. I know I need to be reminded of that. And I believe... You know, there are numerous references in all the Gospels about Jesus going away to a quiet place, right? He leaves, the, he leaves the, the crowds and he goes off into the wilderness and he spends time with the Father. Now, we don't, only one time do we hear much of what the conversation was about, and that's when Jesus was in the garden, right? And he pled with God to take away what was ahead for him. But I'm convinced that what was going on in those quiet moments was God the Son spending time with God the Father and God the Father reminding God the Son about his true identity so that he would be able to endure all that he endured. So that he would be, if you want to put it in psychological terms, he would be this fully integrated human to show us the way, to help us to see that it's possible for us to live in a comfortable place with who God has made us to be. So it involves us doing that as well, I believe, taking time to listen, to listen, to hear the voice speaking to us. Well, and then, of course, there's the result. So we've got the, the content of the message. We've heard that. You are beloved of God the Father, and he's pleased with you. You're the recipients. Jesus is the recipient. The timing of it, for Jesus, it was at the beginning of his ministry. It was all throughout his ministry. For us, I believe the timing has to be every day if we can take the time to do that. And then the results of that, for Jesus, the results were he had the ability, the power to go out and to do what God had called him to do and equipped him to do. And for us, it's, in a sense, the same thing. If, if we are secure in, 
the certainty of God's love and approval of us, then it will be much, it will be, we'll be a much better conduit of that love to the people around us in ways that maybe even surprise us. You know, I, um, for a while, um, this has been years ago, I worked as a, my title was coach. <laughs> I worked in a, in a group home for juvenile offenders, boys, young men, probably 17 to 20 years old. It was a, they, it was a step down program. They had been imprisoned and, um, and then they had shown by their good behavior that they could have some freedom. And so they were sent to this place up in the mountains. They, it was kind of like a dormitory that they lived in. And then they, and they had a job during the day. And my job was to, to take these guys, these young men to their jobs <clears throat> and to be there to make sure they didn't run away, <laughs> which some of them did. Um, and boy, it was, a, it was a stretch for me, I tell you. It was a, I still think back on uh, that time doing that. But I, I remember pretty clearly the, a conversation I had with one of the, one of the guys. We were, I don't know what uh, prompted us being in the vehicle, just he and I by ourselves. But he was sort of a leader in the house. The other, the other, the other guys looked up to him. And, um, and, and I remember him always being very vocal. Language was very colorful, as you might imagine. <laughs> but, I, but I can remember saying to him something to the effect that, that, he, was a, that he was a good man that he was a leader, that he had done a good job. There was something that had gone on in the house, and he had shown some leadership and helped the other guys get a job done. And I said, you know, you, you, you are Joe. I don't know what his real name was. I don't remember what his real name was, Joaquin or something like that. You're, you're a good man. And I want you to know that I'm proud of you. I, he was strangely silent <laughs> after hearing those words. Probably had never heard something like that from someone in some place of authority over him the power of that the power of that for us when we know of God's touch on our lives and I can remember another occasion with a parishioner who his wife was ill and and he was a full-time caregiver to her and he he talked to me one-on-one about how how guilty he felt about getting angry with her and and I I said John (laughs) you are doing much more than you can imagine in caring for your wife. And, and, and again, said the same thing to him. What you're doing matters, and you're a good man. And it was, it was amazing the encouragement that that brought to him. And so I, I, want, I want you all this morning to hear that. I want you to hear that, that God's favor does indeed rest on us. I know for us Minnesotans, we don't like to, we think, oh, we're not, we're not like that well, it isn't about being prideful. It's about believing the truth about the creator of the universe's touch on our lives and God wanting us to know that his favor does indeed rest on us and that believing that, leaning into that, does empower us to live our lives with so much more freedom. You know, it's, we, you cannot, we cannot underestimate the importance of the message of love <clears throat> that comes to us over and over again in the Bible. Let me just read one of them here for us as we end our time in this message. This is from Romans chapter 8. My goodness. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Including words of affirmation that you are beloved. Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life 
neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Receive that word and believe it this morning, church. Father, I guess we can't say it often enough and can't say it loud enough or at least clearly enough how grateful we are for your touch on our lives. We confess that sometimes it's hard for us to believe that. We are our own worst critics and there are lots of voices out there that would tell us otherwise. But we thank you for these words this morning and I pray that the church this morning, your people, these good people who have taken time out of their morning to come and be together and to be with you will hear this word and be encouraged. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.